You are listening to the Bethel Church Sermon Podcast, a ministry of Bethel Church in Yale, South Dakota. If you would take your Bibles and turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Ecclesiastes chapter 3. We are in a, in a short series of, of sermons, moving our way, getting a, a taste of Ecclesiastes, seeing how Ecclesiastes points us to Jesus Christ. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, uh, we're going to start reading in, in verse 1. You'll see a very uh, familiar text this morning. If you would, stand with me as we honor the reading of Scripture together. For everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven. A time to be born, a time to die. A time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to seek and a time to be loose. A time, to, a time to keep and a time to cast away. A time to tear and a time to sow. A time to keep silence and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time for war and a time for peace. What gain has the worker from his toil? I have seen the busyness that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. He has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity into man's heart. Yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. I perceive that there is nothing better for them than to be joyful and to do good as long as they live. Also, that everyone should eat, drink, and take pleasure in all his toil. This is, the, this is God's gift to man. I perceive that whatever God does endures forever. Nothing can be added to it, nor anything taken from it. God has done it so that people fear before him that which is already has been, that which is to be, already has been, and God seeks what has been driven away. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, as we approach this text this morning, as we approach the the book of Ecclesiastes again, Lord, we pray that, that your Spirit guide us. Lord, we we ask for your, your help here. Lord, I pray that you would help us to see and guide us toward truth. Lord, we want to see Jesus. Lord, and I pray that we would see him afresh in this text. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. When I say the word frustrating, what comes to your, your mind? What do you, you think of? Are there things that just absolutely frustrate you? I told my wife, and my wife and I went to see Casting Crowns this past week, and we, we got there early, and we were in, in front of the line, and I told her that I wanted to be in front of the line because I really hated to, to wait in, in lines. Lines frustrate me. So I like to be early, so I don't have to wait in the line. But then I sit in the seat waiting for the thing to start, and that frustrates me as well. It's a no-win situation. I don't know what kind of things 
frustrate you, but I, if I had to guess, I would say that about everybody in this room has a short list of things that bring them frustration. But what about things in the Bible? Are there certain passages of Scripture that, that frustrate you for, for one reason or another? Perhaps they are just difficult to understand, or perhaps there's a, a certain place that seems to contradict another place, and it's just difficult for you to reconcile. I would say that this poem in the first eight verses of Ecclesiastes is extremely frustrating. Just think about what Solomon is doing here. He takes 14 pairs of opposites. This is called a a merism. It's a poetical device. Kind of like the phrase that we read over and over in Scripture, heaven and earth. The phrase heaven and earth doesn't mean only ground and sky. It means ground and sky and everything in between. It means all of creation. We get that. So when we read these these 14 pairings here, it paints a, a complete picture of the reality of life. And when you start seeing this text in that light... You get a little bit frustrated. You're born, then you die. It's true for everyone. Sometimes there's not a lot of time in between the two. Sometimes minutes, hours. Sometimes the time to be born is even interrupted. But in due time, in the natural state of things, a person is born. Some, there's a there's hundred years before they die. But the constant, and this is what the text says, the constant, you live and then you die. There's a time. It is appointed man to die, then comes the judgment. It's just frustrating. We say things like, so-and-so died way too early. Or the the 78-year-old guy lived a a good life when for others 78 is far too soon. I I would suggest that R.C. Sproul, one of the the most influential theologians of our time, passed away this week on Thursday. 78 was was too young. I mean, if there's a a person who deserved to live to 100 and keep his mind and and keep teaching, it, it was him. But the the message here is clear. For everything, there is a season. For every time, for every matter under heaven, there is an appointed time. And that is clear here. The idea is, is appointment. There is a season. There is an appointed time for everything. And the question we need to ask off the off the onset is who does the appointing? Who appoints the seasons of life? God does clear in the text. For everything there is a design. An appointed time for this, appointed time to that, and to us who sit and don't see the masterful plan of the designer in its totality, it is frustrating. A couple weeks ago, there were many conversations about how thankful we are for electricity. When it went out for, for hours out here, we, we talked about how people must have lived before they had electricity, and it was difficult for us to even imagine, for us to even comprehend that. But you know, in the end, all of the electricity in the world will not keep us alive. We will die. Right? Right? There's a time to plant, a time to pluck up what is planted, meaning that that sooner or later the weather is going to change. Plants and fruits are going to grow old, and if they remain out in the field, they will be worthless. You must harvest them or they'll be wasted. We don't appoint those times. God does that. 
There's a time to break down and time to, to build. We, we tear down our old houses. We build new houses over the top of them. It's just reality. That even our dwellings get old and are not safe anymore. Or it's just more cost effective to just tear it down and start over. There is a time to kill and a time to heal. This could be talking about capital punishment, and I know our, our minds sometimes tend to, to go there, but the author was just speaking about agriculture, so I think that's best to interpret it in that light. And the idea is that we spend a lot of money to keep animals alive, only to slaughter them in the end. Isn't that frustrating? I read about a, a family dog that kept eating things it shouldn't eat. Stuff that it would eat would get wrapped up in its intestines and it would take an expensive surgery to save the dog's life. And the, the family did something they said they would never do and that's spend lots of money on the family pet. And then the pet got into the same stuff again and needed another surgery. So they obliged. The dog lived then for a while and started to go blind. It couldn't control himself and started to, to mess around the house. And the family put up this for a while, but in the end they had to call the vet to come and put the animal to sleep. We spend all of this money only to end the dog's life in the end. There's a time to weep and others to laugh, to mourn, to dance. It seems as though the times in our lives where we are happy and rejoicing, there is somebody not far from us in the midst of mourning. We go through one of the most exciting times in our lives. We get married, we rejoice, only to see that our, our good friend's marriage fails in the weeks to come. I hope that we can see this in this poem, this great absurdity that is life. Every activity here just cancels another out. Alistair Begg points out there are 14 pluses and 14 minuses here, and they all add up to a great big zero. Every birth ends in death. Every building that we build ends in, is condemned. Every time we celebrate pre peace, there's just a war on the horizon. You know, it is, a, it is a grave mistake to try to give life meaning by adding up all the, the good things in life and then comparing them to the difficult things because when you really think about it, it doesn't work that way. That's kind of the point here. What is it that gives life meaning? Is it the celebrations? Is it the love? The times of dancing? The times of laughing? Our achievements like building buildings? I think sometimes that's how we want to, and we tend to, to look at life. We try not to think about the, the difficulties, but every time there's a plus, there's always a minus. Meaning in life doesn't come from focusing on the positives. One commentator said it this way, the point of the poem is the inevitable sameness and monotony of life under the sun. We all go through these actions. Birth, life, work, love, and then death. Nothing really changes for humanity. Time is a frustrating thing. When we're young, we long for time to move faster. We want to, to get into high school. Then We want to get into college and have more freedom. We want a, a spouse and, and we want children. We want time to move forward so we can get to this or that. And then we have children. We start to, to grow and we start to feel age coming up on our bodies. And we start to move slow, slower and we long for time to slow down as well. Because time goes far too fast. Children start growing faster than you can imagine, and you can't slow it down. And you look back at the young you, and how you wanted to get to this point, and now you just want to stay there. It is frustrating. I'm not the only one that thinks this. Solomon certainly thinks this. 
There was a time some years, there was a time, there was a song some years back by Hootie and the Blowfish called Time. I think it summarizes this uh, poem brilliantly. Um, He says this, Time, why do you punish me? Like a wave bashing into the shore, you wash away my dreams. Time, why you walk away? Like a friend with somewhere to go, you leave me here crying. Can you teach me about tomorrow and all the pain and sorrow running free? Because tomorrow is just another day and I don't believe in time. Time I don't understand. Children killing in the street. Maybe their mothers won't cry tonight. Can you teach me about tomorrow all the pain and sorrow that's running free? But tomorrow is just another day and I just don't believe in Time is wasting. Time is walking. Time, you're no friend of mine. I don't know where I'm going. I I think I'm out of my mind thinking about time. And if I die tomorrow, yeah, just lay me down to sleep. You can hear the, the frustration in his voice. Time is wasting. Time is walking. Time is not my friend of mine. And it doesn't help to say that you don't believe in time because even if you don't believe in it, it keeps walking, it keeps going, and it keeps leaving you there. And the question is, is in all of this frustration, in all of this thinking about the monotony of life, where do we turn in our frustration? Solomon looked at life, he looked at time and how the world was designed, and and he was frustrated, he understood the source of his frustration was not in randomness, grasp this, make make sure that we, we see this, the author here saw order and design, just as the, the Hootie song did, time isn't a random thing, time keeps moving, there's nothing random about life and death, there is order even if we don't understand it all. But when we start looking at the large picture, there is no surprises. Draw your attention down to verses 9 and 10. What gain has the worker from his toil? And just think about that phrase. Coming on the heels of this poem, What gain has the worker from his toil? In other words, what is the point of life? I have seen the busyness that God has given the children of man to be busy with. God, you've appointed all of these times and seasons. We're busy. We we go through this. All of this from, from birth to death and everything in between. We go through it all. And what is the point of it? At this point, we have to go back to Genesis chapter 3. This text, this this whole word toil, draws our attention back to Genesis 3, and I'm going to start reading there in, in verse 17. God said to Adam, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all of the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field by the sweat of your face, and you shall eat bread until you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Think about this for a moment. So here we see that because of Adam's sin, there was a a specific consequence that was meant to frustrate him. If you miss that point, I think you miss it. It was meant to frustrate him. Thorns and thistles. You want to eat? Well, because of your sin, you need to battle thorns and thistles. Life will be hard. There will be sweat, and you will work to get out of the ground, what will sustain you, 
until you die and you are returned to the ground. See that in there? See the irony? People work their tails off to eat and live only to die. That's Genesis 3. That's not Ecclesiastes 3. So really nothing is changed. There's not a a new concept. It is only that Solomon is observing this. He's observing the curse. The the vanity and the futility of life and and work. And he's experiencing the, the frustration of it all. Then we get to verse 11. Verse 11 is is one of those verses that is quoted a lot. Part of it is quoted a lot. In reality, it's a difficult verse to understand. There there are three parts to it. Let's just take those three sections as we discern where we are to look in our frustration. Look at the first clause in in verse 11. He has made everything beautiful in its time. That the he there is, is obviously referring back to God. And the, the fact that, that God has made everything shouldn't be a new concept to us. God made everything. There was nothing made that was not made by him. And here Solomon is confirming that. Even time. All of these seasons. Everything is God's work. God's design. And the question becomes, how did God make everything? Because the the reader of the above poem might be tempted to think that God made everything a bit flawed. That there's really no point in anything that God did. But Solomon deals with that. The verse says that God made everything beautiful, or God made everything appropriate, would be another translation. Again, we're forced to look back to Genesis when God says over and over that what he did was good. Here we see that God's initial act of creation was beautiful. It was done right and everything fit just as God designed it to fit. The point here in in the, the word that draws our attention back to the poem is time. The first eight verses. The, the point is clearly that God who created everything, that time itself is authored by God. God is in charge of time. Every place, every time fits together just as God designed it. God is completely sovereign and has ordered time and everything is according to God's sovereign wisdom. Can't miss this. To look at the the world In the order, the obvious design, we see a a masterful creator who orchestrated all of this. And we also know that the fall in Genesis 3 corrupted it all. The world and everything in it is, is marred by sin, and this is frustrating. We work the ground, we labor for food to sustain ourselves, to live only to end up in the ground. You see, our sin is the source of frustration. Now the next phrase. Also, he has put eternity into man's heart. This phrase is quoted a lot, but not in context Not in the context of the the frustration that Solomon is experiencing. The frustration that we see when we read this poem and we start thinking about it. I, I want you to see here that the word eternity contrasts with the word time. To make things utterly simple, time has a beginning and end. Eternity does not. In time, we are born, we start our life, we die. That is the end of our life. We can't help thinking in terms of time, in return of beginning and end and sequential events. One of the reasons that our 
that our youngsters don't like the thought of heaven is that they believe they will be bored there. Day in, day out, doing what? Chilling with Jesus and Grandma. That will get old. They put this this frustration that they know now in this world and they carry it on into heaven, which is not in time. My point is that we can't help but think in terms of time. Eternity isn't just a starting point and then a history that never ends. A heaven that goes on and on and on and on. That isn't eternity. Eternity is an existence outside of time. There's no yesterday. There's no tomorrow. All there is, is now, always. So young people, it's impossible to be bored Because there is not time. Being bored is when you don't know what to do with your time. So when Solomon uses the words time and eternity, he's contrasting them. In other words, when he said that he put eternity in the hearts of humanity, he is saying that there is something in us that knows that this time, beginning and end, isn't all there is. There's more to this. There's more to life. There's a desire built in us to live forevermore. This vanity that Solomon speaks of, this everything under the sun being meaningless, eternity in our hearts says that there's something even more. This isn't, this isn't, this cannot be all there is. Because if this is all there is, then there is no point. Seeing that? There is something beyond this life. To live as if this life is all there is would be utterly absurd. The next phrase, not often quoted, is, yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. We've already said that we live within time and that this is the lens in which we see everything. We see everything from the time perspective and God has put eternity in our hearts and therefore we cannot fully know or fully grasp God's plan for us. Our knowledge is is limited. The frustration of life points us to the one who has it all in his hand. Yes, there's a time to be born, a time to die. That frustration points us to the one who holds death in his hand, who's sovereign over death, who shows us that that there is more. There's life beyond that. And there are larger questions than Why did this person have to die? And that is, where are they now? There are a few people that would say that when we die, we just cease to exist. Or the ground is all there is. But most people would suggest that there is something else. Most people invent some kind of life after death in one way or another, We all become angels or we're reunited with our loved ones, something sort of Christian, but not really. Most people are are spiritual. The reason that, that God has placed eternity in our hearts and we we don't know God's whole entire plan is so we don't invent something. But so often we do. And heaven becomes about angels or harps, about pleasures that we haven't obtained on earth, or the company of loved ones that, we've, that have passed before us. In other words, we make eternity or heaven about us. What we think will make us happy. Being an angel or pursuing pleasure or the union with a, a loved one that has gone on. But my friend, don't miss the point here. 
The point is that God has placed eternity in our heart. The point is that he has authored a big and marvelous plan that we cannot comprehend. Because this is all meant to drive us to Jesus. Not to invent something else. Not to invent some story that we heard over here with some story that we heard over here that sounds right. Our own version of an afterlife that makes us happy. It's meant to drive us to Jesus. This frustration with the world that we live in, that is played out in this poem, in the whole book of Ecclesiastes, is not there. It's not designed that we should invent our own version of heaven. But that we would look to the one who created the world. The one who created time. The one who designed the plan and ask him, what is the meaning? Where is purpose in this? Where do you want me to go? What is next? Now God, knowing this, designed a plan. A plan that is played out on the pages of Scripture. And the most remarkable thing is that God doesn't just leave us in history to imagine or make up the answers to the questions that we have. But God, when the time was perfect, this is how God does everything. When the time was perfect, He entered into space and time. Jesus took on humanity. Jesus was completely human. I love the the conversation that he has in John chapter 14. Jesus makes a a famous statement there about leaving and going to prepare a a place for the disciples. And then he says in in verse 4, and and you know the way to where I'm going. And Thomas says, looks at Jesus and says, "Um, Jesus, we don't know where you're going. How how will we know the way? Jesus then says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. But the conversation isn't over. Jesus says that the disciples know the, the Father and have seen Him because they know Jesus and have seen Jesus. And Philip is confused. And Jesus And Philip says, but Jesus, show us the Father and that will be enough. And then Jesus declares, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. He said the the words that he spoke were not his own words, but they were the the words that he spoke on the authority of, of the Father. Because he and the Father were one. Here's the point, and here's why I love this conversation. It is in Jesus, the person of Jesus, the real in space, in time person of Jesus, that these disciples were able to, able to understand something of eternity. Something of God's plan. In other words, Jesus is saying that it is through Him that the disciples have their frustration met. They were not left in frustration. Show us the Father. That'll be enough for us. We know there's more to this. There's, we know there's more. Just show us the more. And Jesus is saying, you've seen me. You've seen the more. The frustration that we experience in life is meant to point us right to Jesus. And Jesus is enough. That's the point. When we talk about Jesus at Christmas, when we think about the the birth of Jesus and sing about Jesus, we're talking about God becoming human. God taking on flesh, dwelling among us. The, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. That's John 1.14. Jesus wasn't created. Jesus took on flesh. He became part of human history. And before that, He was outside of time. He created time. He became flesh so that we might see God. So that we would not be left to make up what heaven is like, what eternity is like. 
so that we would see for ourselves in the pages of Scripture the, the greatness of God in Jesus Christ. We would see God's plan of redemption unfold. We would see the, the futility that, that sin has caused. And we would see how Jesus restores creation. In the first chapter of Matthew, we read that an angel visited Joseph and told him to, to name the child Jesus because he would save people from their sins. This is God's plan of redemption unfolding. That a, a human race who was plunged into sin because of the action of one man might be saved because of the death of one man. That you and I who follow Adam's example in sin against God can be forgiven if we would place our faith and trust in the work of Jesus Christ who gave up Himself and died and suffered so that we might be spared. And I pray that God would, would open your eyes to this precious truth this morning if He hasn't already. That you would see the, the beauty of Jesus. The truth of the, of the Gospel. That you would embrace Jesus in, in faith. That you would turn to Him from your sin. And I pray that God would do that in your life. Give you the eyes to see the Gospel. And comprehend that Ecclesiastes 3 points us to Jesus. This text is not meant to frustrate us. But it's meant to lead us to the One who gives answers, who gives meaning, who gives purpose, and who redeems us from the frustration that is caused by our sin. And the question is, is will you embrace Him today? Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank You for, we thank you for Your Word. We thank You for Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank You that the, that the, the Bible, that the Word points us to Him. That the, the frustration that was, that was heaped on this world because of, of sin. Lord, we pray that You would take and use that to lead us to Jesus Christ. Lord, redeem us from the curse. Let us see the, the beauty and the truth of the Gospel and the greatness of Jesus Christ. And in these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for listening to this sermon resource from BethelMBChurch.org. If you'd like to learn more about Bethel Church or find other resources, please visit our website at BethelMBChurch.org. Bethel Church exists to bring glory to God by promoting the joyful worship of Jesus Christ both here and abroad.